Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation. The mission of the Future of Freedom Foundation is to present an uncompromising case for the libertarian philosophy. And as part of that philosophy, for 27 years of our existence, we have called for an end to the war on drugs. And as part of that mission, we have brought together a, an array of speakers to present their views on why this government program should be brought to an end. And I'm pleased to have with me today Neil Franklin, who is the executive director of a fantastic organization called LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. This is a group of law enforcement uh, officials or former law enforcement officials who are taking an ardent stance against the war on drugs. And so Neil's going to be talking to us today about why he believes, as a former police officer, this war should be ended. So welcome, Neil. Hey, Jacob. Thanks for having me on today. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your background, Neil, and what caused you to finally join this organization called LEAP. Yeah, Jacob. So I've got 34 years in policing in the state of Maryland. Uh, I began with Maryland State Police in the late 1970s, uh, stayed with them for 23 years before I retired. And most of my career with the Maryland State Police was in drug enforcement. I worked undercover. I commanded drug task forces. I then did some work in criminal investigation. And my final two years, I was the head of training for the state police. I was then recruited by the Baltimore Police Department to head up and reform their training division. Went there for four years. And in 2004, I went to another police agency here in Maryland for six more years, still engaged occasionally in drug investigations and heading up their criminal investigation division. Um, so it, it's, it's been an exciting career. And during that time, uh, most of my career, I had no idea of the effects, the negative effects of the war on drugs upon society, upon the policing profession, and uh, upon specifically communities of color. Um, and it wasn't until the year 2000, so I, this is my first year working with the Baltimore Police Department as the head of their training division. A good friend of mine, Ed Totley, was working undercover with the FBI in the Washington, D.C. area. He was buying cocaine from a mid-level drug dealer, and uh, the drug dealer assassinated it, 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 it totally. Um, the drug dealer did not know that Ed was a police officer. He just thought that he was another drug dealer he was doing business with. And it's in the nature of this game. Uh, you know, you control your market share with violence. Um, it's, it's, it's screw the other person as quickly and as often as you can. And unfortunately, sometimes you end up taking the life of someone else. And that's what happened to Ed. Ed this I wanted to keep the money in the drugs, increase his profits, and Ed was the, the target that particular night for that to happen. So it was violence that brought me to this place uh, of finding Leap online in 2003. They were a year old then as I was searching for answers. And I joined Leap and actually started speaking officially for Leap in 2008. And that's what we are. We're a speakers bureau talking about the harmful effects to the war on drugs and how it how it affects liberties in this country and let me tell you something Jacob when you lose your life that's the ultimate loss of liberty yeah absolutely is leap uh, does leap consist only of of former law enforcement officers or could an active duty law enforcement officer join leap no we have uh, most of us are, are retired uh, and that's because it's very difficult for active police officers to speak about this uh, controversial issue. Um, some people still see it as a third rail polit political issue. Um, but we do have current police officers. We do have even police chiefs that are serving. But they're few. It's few of them that have the courage and willingness to speak out about this issue and the atrocities of this issue. But we're working to change that. Um, and I think we're going to have great success next year as we work on our narrative uh, to make this case. 
we'll be able to recruit more active law enforcement officials, but not just, Jacob, not just police officers, you know, it's, it's prosecutors, it's judges, it's corrections officials. Our board chief, Van Wickler, is a um, superintendent of the Chester County Jail in New Hampshire, by the way, so he's active. He's currently running a jail and a uh, very, very good speaker on this issue. Yeah, it's a phenomenal thing. Uh, I didn't realize that it extended beyond law enforcement officials. Uh, that, that's fantastic. It's a phenomenal thing. The number of people across the board, mainstream people, including prosecutors and judges that are uh, now calling for an end to the war on drugs. Your point about your, your friend getting killed is a very moving thing. I mean, this is, this is, this war has taken, we often talk about the adverse consequences of the war on drugs, but very rarely do we talk about that particular adverse consequence. That there, there, there's police who are getting killed in the process of, of enforcing this war. It, do you have any uh, grasp on the numbers here that we're talking about? Well, um, I do not. And, and I made attempts in the past to try to figure out exactly how many of our law enforcement officials have are losing their lives as it relates to the war on drugs. But the data collection part of that, you know, on part of the Department of Justice and, and some of our states, there's not a whole lot of, uh, how, how can I say this, um, uh, the data points are very difficult to compare as you go from one state to the next. And the federal are very loose in, in the data that they require and ask for. My point is, let me give you a couple examples. You know, it's clear that Ed Totley, my friend, when he was killed, you could clearly tie that to the war on drugs, the drug prohibition policy. However, when a police officer maybe is killed in a particular neighborhood, maybe responding to a particular call, um, you don't always know what the assailant's involvement is in the war on drugs. Um, it's not always that clear, especially when we're talk talking about citizens who are killed uh, in some of our communities and neighborhoods. Um, we had in 2003 a family of seven, a Dawson family, who was killed in Baltimore City by a drug dealer. They lived in East Baltimore in a corner of a row house. And on that corner, this drug dealer set up shop with his crew. The mother was working with the police to get him arrested along with his crew, and he found out about it. He then set their home on fire to send a message, and he killed the entire family in the middle of the night. Five kids, mother and a father. Those seven murders are not considered drug-related murders. That's, that's kind of my point. So when you're trying to find data on this, it's very difficult to attach a, a murder to the drug trade. So. Oh, that makes sense. Now, how do, you, how do you respond to somebody that says, look, this is obviously a, a, a very evil person that's going to engage in this. What's wrong with prosecuting him and putting him away in jail uh, and, and really doing whatever is necessary to win this war on drugs? wrong is that we've created the environment for him to to do this you know one of the things that we do at least we compare prohibition laws up to today with alcohol prohibition back in the 1920s most people are familiar with that history they understand al capone and organized crime and how that came about they understand how much money they made from the bootlegging industry peddling alcohol um, they understand that even back then they had to drive by shootings and running gun battles. That's that where the, where the nucleus of was alcohol, alcohol prohibition. Um, the corruption that came with that, uh, the poison alcohol that flowed through our streets. And even with that huge enforcement effort to quash, you know, to crush the alcohol industry back in the 1920s, we ended up with more speakeasies 
underground bars than what we had above ground before alcohol prohibition. We still had the abuse of alcohol. We still had, you know, men getting drunk and going home and beating their wives and their kids. So the policies of prohibition did nothing to, to, to eliminate uh, abuse, to eliminate uh, alcoholism, to eliminate the bars and the speakeasies. It exacerbated the situation. And we're, we repeated this disastrous history over again with drug prohibition, especially when Richard Nixon got a hold of it in the 1970s and committed so many resources to local law enforcement to go out here and arrest people for selling on our street corners and elsewhere. If we had regulated to control these drugs, we wouldn't be in a situation and we wouldn't have this drug dealer setting a home on fire and killing seven family members. Yeah, I think the suggestion then is that if you if you end the war on drugs, you don't have this unsavory element selling drugs like this guy that that burned the, this family. And you, you also would have had your friend alive because he wouldn't have been enforcing this these kind of laws. Is that right? Yeah. And, and people say you're absolutely right, Jacob. And people say, well, if you end you know, if you end prohibition and you and you regulate and control these drugs and you get them off the street corners and, and whatever, these criminals, these thugs, they'll just go on and commit other crimes. They'll start other, you know, areas of organized crime and, and, and wreak havoc. Let me tell you something, Jacob. There's, there's nothing else that they can do that is nearly as profitable as selling drugs in a prohibited market. Little time, little effort, and you can make ungodly amounts of money. You can't make money committing petty burglaries. You can't make money committing robberies. Every day, people are carrying less and less cash. You know, so, and because of the money that you can make selling drugs, this enormous amount of money, it makes it very easy for these gangs and crews to recruit kids, young kids, to, to fill the vacancy that the police create and the police create the vacancies when we conduct these raids we make all of these arrests we put all these people in prison but there's a never-ending stream to young people being recruited by these gangs to fill those vacancies to staff the corners to carry the guns and to continue with the violence that we see on a daily basis okay well, explain to me how that works why, why does drug prohibition result in these enormous profits that can be made? So first of all, as with anything that you sell, anything that you market, you've got to have a customer base. You've got to have a market for it, right? We love drugs, okay? Whether it's alcohol, whether it's caffeine from coffee, whether it's heroin, whether it's marijuana, we love offering substances. The vast majority of people that use these sub substances, alcohol, the, the illegal stuff, the cocaine, the heroin, 90% of these people uh, don't have abuse problems with using the drugs. It's a small percentage that do. So when you have this type of vast market for a commodity, now all you need is someone to supply it. When you put laws of prohibition in place, the first thing that happens is you have given up all power to regulate, to control, to distribute any of those products. And that's what we've done. So now what happens, you pushed it underground into the hands of organized crime, into the hands of the cartels, and we know how violent they are, into the hands of crews and gangs, people who don't have jobs, who have to make money. We all have to make money to survive in this world, especially this world of capitalism. We've got to make money. So now you've created an opportunity to uh, buy a quantity of heroin, to buy a quantity of marijuana, to buy a quantity of cocaine, which is relatively up here today. I mean, you can get cocaine and heroin today 80 to 90 percent pure. So I buy it. I, I also get a hold of some cutting agent and I, I split it in half, make two or three times as much. 
And then I, I sell it. I, re, I build my crew. I recruit my kids. I establish my corners. And I sell it to all the people who want to use it. It's very easy to do. Um, that's, again, alcohol. When we had the prohibition of alcohol, everybody became a manufacturer of alcohol overnight. You know, uh, erecting these stills in the, in the backwoods, you know, in the hills and the mountains and elsewhere, um, brewing alcohol products, shipping it in cars, distributing it to the people who were selling it in, in these speakeasies and elsewhere. Because people like to drink alcohol. People like to use marijuana. People like to use heroin. People like to use cocaine. There's a market for it. Either we're going to control it as a society and regulate it and keep it out of the hands of our children by placing time, use, and age restrictions upon it, or we're going to do what we did and turn it over to organized crime and gangs and crews and let them manage it any way they see fit. And we know how they manage it. They manage it with violence. They manage it with, with murders and guns and kidnappings. And they just wreak havoc in our neighborhoods and communities. Yeah, it's a great point that one way or another, people are going to get drugs because they want drugs. And it's just a matter of whether it's going to be a black market with all the gangs and violence, or it's going to be a legalized, legitimate market dealing with pharmacies and reputable dealers that are providing the substance that people want. You mentioned earlier about people of color. Give me the, the racial aspects and consequences of the war on drugs. So, uh, in the 1970s, prior to the war on drugs, in this country, we had less than half a million people in prison. And after Richard Nixon made money available for local law enforcement to get in on the war on drugs, to go after these people selling drugs in our communities, we started this, this, this increase of, of filling our prisons. Today, a little over four decades later, we have 2.3 million people in prison. The vast majority of people that we have in prison, there's a direct correlation to the war on drugs. And blacks are roughly 13% of the U.S. population. And when you look at the prison population in this country, blacks are around 35% of that population. When you look at the charges, you will see, when you, when, and when you look at like charges among blacks and among whites, drug-related charges, you will see that blacks are arrested at a higher rate convicted at a higher rate, and he also received longer sentences at a higher rate. Um, and, and even when you, when you do, when you look at the data on who uses and sells illegal drugs among just about every demographic, whether we're talking Latino, black, white, um, and otherwise, the rates of use and the rates of selling are relatively the same. But yet, again, those numbers of arrest, conviction, and sentences continue to be extremely high in the black community. Um, and, it's, and, and Jacob, it's not just about the justice system and the effects of the justice system on the black community under the war on drugs. But as I said before, where you had, and, I, and I'll try to, to, to cover this as briefly as possible, but where you have these cities like Baltimore, Cleveland, Detroit, Philadelphia, all across this nation, you go back to the 60s and 70s, and I'm a child of the 60s, you know, black families, the black fathers in these families were able to get employment at, at places in Baltimore like Bethlehem Steel, General Motors, General Electric, Western Electric, and, and they got really good, high paid, high paying blue collar jobs and he had very little education. My father had a sixth grade education. He worked on the port as a longshoreman. But when we started outsourcing these jobs and when, when these blue collar jobs started leaving our populated centers, our cities, a lot of people were put out of work. A lot of these black men who didn't have education were put out of work and it affected the port where my father worked. So what was left? 
drug trade was flourishing. The drug trade has always been flourishing in, in the United States. And many of these men had to do what they had to do. They picked up what we refer to as a hustle, and they went out selling drugs. My father picked up a hustle of the illegal numbers racket. I don't know if you remember that, oh, but yeah. before we had the state lottery, we had the, 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 the illegal numbers, and that's what my father did to make ends meet. But we didn't start a war on the numbers racket. We started a war on the war on drugs. We made the, the, the numbers racket legal. That's the lotto today, mega millions and all that comes with that. But we still have the war on drugs. So all these black fathers that picked up this hustle, we now started targeting. We now started going after. And we started putting all these people in prison, and that's the incline that I referred to earlier about the increase in the prison population in this country during this time period of the war on drugs. What happened to those families, Jacob? You know, so you, you remove the father figure from the family, put them in prison. The sons that remain in the family, they now feel like, okay, it's now my turn to go out and bring money into the household, and I go out and do exactly what dad did, all right? In addition to that, Excuse me. In addition to that, um, the mothers now had to leave the household to go pick up a job or two here and there to make ends meet. So who's raising the kids? The streets are raising the kids. And the gangs and crews that are growing because of the illicit drug market are raising the kids. So we started this cycle of pulling family members out of the black family sending them to prison, in and out of prison, back and forth, no jobs available. Even if they come out, they couldn't get a job anyway because now they've got a record, a criminal record. And we just created this vicious cycle of criminalizing people under the war on drugs umbrella. And you know what? Here's, here's what really, really hurts. Is that after four decades of these harsh policies on the war on drugs, what the hell has it solved? What, what has it solved? If, if, you, if you were going after a reduction in overdose deaths, hell, they're skyrocketing and they continue to go up. You know, if you want to reduce addiction, it hasn't worked. If you wanted to reduce crime, that definitely hasn't worked because most of the crime that we experience is because of drug prohibition. It hasn't solved a damn thing. If anything, it has made conditions even worse. We've added to the problem of drug abuse tenfold. That, that is an absolutely fascinating point. When you, when you add up all the death and destruction, including the death of your friend, all the people who have been incarcerated, um, all the resources that have been put into this thing, what has been accomplished? I mean, the, the drug warriors themselves will admit that their war hasn't been won. That's why they want to continue waging it. But, you know, it, it seems to me, Neil, that it, it was understandable for black families, especially in the inner cities, 40 years ago to say there's drugs here in the in the in the inner city in our communities we want these mandatory minimum sentences we want this fierce law enforcement but after 40 years of experience with this thing you have to ask yourself why any black family especially in the inner city would not see the consequences of this and join us in trying to end this horrific government program and and bringing it up to the surface and treating it as a as a is a social social problem rather than a criminal justice problem. Jacob, we were we were all tricked into this, um, and I and I agree. At the beginning, we didn't have the data to look at to see that we were headed in a very very bad direction. We didn't have the data, but after a couple of decades, the data started coming in, and we did we could see. You know, many of the people that supported this war on drugs and the harsh sentencing, the mandatory minimums, especially coming through the 1980s with, you know, crack cocaine and all of that, many of those people that supported these policies were black leaders, faith leaders, political leaders. And, you know, some have, have seen the error of their ways, but we still have a few that refuse to see it, unfortunately. And, you know, it's, we talked about a few things, Jacob, but we haven't even begun to scratch the surface as it, as it relates to our liberties in this country. Uh, civil forfeiture policies of where we, the government, police can take your property and not even charge you with a crime. We can take your car, your home, your farm. Uh, 
your money and not charge you with, with a crime. All of that came out of the war on drugs in the 1980s under Ronald Reagan. Now, I understand the reason for it. They wanted to go after the, the proceeds and tools of these drug kingpins who were engaged in selling drugs. But we've, we've gone too far. We, we're no longer going after the kingpins with these civil forfeiture policies. We're going after the average citizen and taking $75 out of their wallet. You know, and we're, we're, we're taking their cars because we find a marijuana cigarette on a floorboard. And that's not what these policies were intended to be. What about the militarization of our police departments? That's not because of the war on terror, Jacob. That, that began with the war on drugs. And us, the police, saying that we needed all these resources to go after these violent drug gangs and criminals and crews and the cartels. So we, they started giving us machine guns and we started building SWAT teams. Uh, we started using these SWAT teams instead of going after someone who was barricaded, for instance, in a bank robbery, doing a bank robbery or barricaded in a home with hostages. We started using SWAT teams for going after medical marijuana grows in someone's house where there's not one single bit of evidence regarding violence or guns or anything else. And now the militarization is being used to suppress First Amendment rights during peaceful protests, showing this force using these MRAPs and machine guns and everything else. We've in this conversation here, we've only begun to scratch the surface of how the war on drugs is suppressing our liberties in this country, and it's getting worse every day. Um, the, the Department of Justice just concluded an investigation here in Baltimore on uh, policing practices, and they looked at five years of policing here in Baltimore and zero tolerance policing uh, strategies and practices. And he ruled that we have had hundreds of thousands of unconstitutional stops of our citizens during this time period. At the end of the day, when you really look at the data, um, they initially said it was a little over 300,000 unconstitutional stops in a little over four years. But when you really look at the data, it's more like 2.1 million unconstitutional stops during that time period. And that's according to the Department of Justice. Yeah, and nothing really ever happens to these cops that, that are doing all these stops, does it? I mean, it's not like, I mean, I guess theoretically people can sue, but who can afford to do that? And what are the damages involved? You know, um, you're absolutely right. And uh, but here's something that most people, especially our cops, don't, don't, don't understand. They're just as much a victim of these systems and policies as are the citizens who are losing their constitutional rights doing these stops. Um, we're given a job. We have laws placed in front of us to go find the drugs. And because our policing leaders have not guided us appropriately, have, have not held people accountable, we then begin to move a little off center of the constitutional protections that we have in this country. Case in point, when you're given an order to go, go out and make as many arrests as you can, and if you don't make these arrests, you're then pulled aside, you're chastised, you know, you're, you're given a bad evaluation, you're not promoted, you're not given a good assignment, and you may receive some sort of administrative penalty for not producing. So when you're giving, when you're given those orders to go out and make these arrests, Jacob, the easiest arrests to make are for the possession of marijuana, the possession of heroin, possession of cocaine. You know where to go. You go to your poor communities, you go to your black communities, you go to these communities where people don't have jobs because you know they're going to be selling drugs and using drugs in communities where there's low employment opportunity. So our police are given these instructions by our political leaders, by our mayors, by our governors, and um, by other political representatives, and then the police chief and, and the hierarchy in the police department. If we can 
if we can get our political leaders to back off of these policies that, that not only do not work, but are counterproductive to public safety, and to move the war on drugs from a place of war into a place of health, give it to our healthcare practitioners to deal with the issues of abuse, and back the police off, we can eventually get to a place where we would have safer communities. We could eliminate the crews and gangs that we have on our street corners. We can, we, we can dethrone the cartels who are now in over a thousand communities here in the United States. And we can arrest the erosion of our constitutional rights, Fourth Amendment rights, uh, you know, to be free from unreasonable search and seizure, First Amendment rights, and Fifth Amendment, Thirteenth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment, you know, we're supposed to have due process before you can take our property from us. And under our civil forfeiture policies, take what we don't get due process. It's a joke. Yeah, it truly is amazing how they are able to, and they do, just stop regular people that, that have to deal in cash, which a lot of poor people do, and they steal their money. It's really highway robbery in a literal sense. And then they say, if you don't like it, you can sue us, but they're holding the money. And so very few people can sue. Um, so I really, you know, your point about the, the corrupting aspect of this war is really, uh, really fascinating. Are you familiar with what happened in Talia, Texas many years ago? Um, is this the, the police officer yeah. that were making a number of arrests that weren't, uh, they were planting drugs and, and, and they, they went into a community and rounded up all of these people and, and the investigations were bogus. Is that the one you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Would you, would you tell a little bit about what happened there? Yeah, yeah so in, in generalities, we had, because we put so much pressure upon our police officers to go out here and perform, you know, police officers will do anything for a medal or for some sort of recognition about doing this police work. So when you had the war, so what happened down here in Texas is that you had a, a police officer, a couple of police officers who were who were creating cases in a black community of of, of drug dealing at this enormous scale, pretty much um, uh, placing bogus charges on people, you know, uh, obtaining search warrants that weren't valid, uh, using if falsified information, incorrect information. And at the end of the day, they went into this black community and literally made an enormous amount of arrest in this community. Uh, and at the end of the day, when he went back and, and took a, a detail in this effort to combat drugs in this community, uh, they realized that one officer in particular uh, had was involved in a, in a lot of corruption, falsification of information, um, through the use of uh, so-called confidential informants and, and otherwise. And basically, these people were innocent, absolutely innocent. But yet, we ended up arresting so many people, placing criminal charges on them, making, you know, wrecking their lives from here on forward. Because even if they get these records expunged, you know, these, this information is in cyberspace. And in the city, we had a couple of New York City detectives that because of the pressure to perform, to make drug arrests, this particular team, when they had one of their members, team members who, who was a little behind on making arrest, drug arrest, they started planting drugs on unsuspecting New York City uh, black and brown folks, blacks and Latinos, so that this guy can increase his numbers. And of course, it, it was found out, and the officers were charged, and they were arrested and, and prosecuted. But we have too many cases. Too often, these officers are not discovered. People are arrested. Drugs are planted on them, and their lives are ruined. This is the pressure. This is the pressure that these officers are under to perform in this in this environment of vision laws, and and it's time for it to end. You know, Jacob, this how we view young black men in this country 
as I believe it was Hillary Clinton who referred to them, as many of us did back then, and as, as super predators. That's all about the war on drugs. Because when you hear, when, when someone says to you, what in your mind does a drug dealer look like? What's the first image that pops into your mind? It's a young black male, maybe the, his pants are sagging, uh, maybe his hat's turned a little sideways, baseball cap. The image that comes to your mind is a young black male in a black community when you, when you use that term drug dealer. And it's not just in the minds of police officers, it's not just in the minds of the average citizen I'm a black male, and it's in my mind when I hear that terminology because that's what we've done in society. We've communicated this message to people that drug dealers are young black males. And not are they young black males, they are violent young black males. What does that do to the psyche of a police officer who has the job of enforcing these policies in many of our poor communities? You want to know why we have so many shootings of young black people in this country by police officers? Yeah, that it, you, it's you're war on drugs. It's it really is. It's corrupting. It has ruined lives all across the uh, the spectrum. Uh, Neil, thank you very much. This has been an absolutely fantastic rendition and summary as to why this government program should be brought to an end immediately. No doubt. And Jacob, I thank you for having me on and keep doing what you do. It's great work. Thank you. And thank you again for your time and your perspective.